Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Safwan Masri, Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. And it is truly my pleasure to welcome you to our University Leadership Series, launched last year to bring us into discussion with Columbia's senior leadership, luminaries in their respective fields, acclaimed internationally for their accomplishments, and now in this new series, available to consider the critical issues of the day with the Columbia community and the global public. Today, the topic at hand is climate change. I am not sure there is a more all-encompassing issue to discuss. The fact that we are living with an existential threat that comes without an exact timeline or a precise target pervades our consciousness, paralyzing some, causing denial and inaction, and mobilizing others to march, protest, sail around the world, or make apocalyptic movies urging people to pay attention. But it can be hard to know what exactly to pay attention to. Is it the sudden storm appearing out of nowhere and flattening a community, then disappearing both from our view and from the news cycle? Or is it the slow, steady changes, warming seas, higher tides, persistent droughts, disappearing songbirds. Can climate change really be every worrisome thing? The answer is, as you likely know, yes. Climate change is a threat multiplier. Carbon emissions and rising temperatures degrade the environment in ways we may adapt to or respond to as a temporary crisis, but they also drive displacement, forcing fish and animals, including people from their habitats and into new territories or into extinction. The loss of lands and of livelihoods creates new migration patterns and fierce competition for shrinking natural resources. We are seeing this across the globe with refugees being denied entry at border after border behind which there are those affected by other forms of climate collapse. It is an issue at once local and global, highly specific, situations completely connected. Of course, these cascading effects are precisely why the strategies with which we address climate change must be comprehensive, scientifically accurate, and integrated at a policy level and internationally. The need is urgent, but we do know that mitigation of human-caused climate change is possible and necessary. To that end, I am pleased to introduce three of the four founding deans of the Columbia Climate School. The first such school of its kind in the world, the first new school at Columbia in at least 25 years, and the first educational institution created in the school's current design and structure. That is a lot of firsts and it is exciting and something of which we can feel proud. But of course, the global issues addressed by the Columbia Climate School and the urgency surrounding them compel this bold approach. It is not possible to address all critical climate issues as a single institution, but Columbia is now well placed to play a leading role in research, training and preparation of successive generations of students, each of which will bear the impact of climate change in increasing measures and each of whom will devise new approaches and solutions to the myriad problems unfolding across the planet. The Columbia Climate School is designed to be a resource beyond academia, helping the public at large and assisting policymakers as they take the necessary steps to secure our planet's future. But before I introduce our speakers today, I want to take a brief moment to acknowledge the recent loss of one of our own, climate scientist Lisa Goddard, who succumbed to breast cancer earlier this month. Lisa was far too young. Dr. Goddard spent most of her professional life here at Columbia, and she, like our panelists today, was a true visionary, understanding that what mattered most to people was not the distant future, but the changing seasonal weather patterns that could upend everything. Lisa completely transformed the field of predictive modeling to help us all respond better to the drastic weather events we are experiencing. I know we feel her loss today and that her work is part of what made this meeting today possible. I now turn to introductions. 
Alex Halliday is the Climate School's founding dean and the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. He joined the Earth Institute four years ago after spending more than a decade at the University of Oxford, during which time he was dean of science and engineering. With about 400 published research papers, Halliday has been a pioneer in developing mass spectrometry to measure small isotopic variations in everything from meteorites to seawater to living organisms, helping to shed light on the birth and early development of our solar system, the interior workings of the Earth, and the processes that affect Earth's surface environment. Welcome, Alex. Next, I would like to introduce Maureen Ramo. Maureen, or Mo, as she is called, is the co-founding dean of the Climate School. She is also the G. Unger Vetlesen Professor of Earth and Climate Sciences, as well as the director of Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, the first climate scientist, scientist to lead the observatory. Professor Ramos' research focuses on the history and causes of climate change in the past, including understanding the consequences of climate change for future sea level and ice sheet stability. Her research has been profiled in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, US News and World Report, Discover Magazine, as well as featured on the History Channel, BBC World Service, BBC's Planet Earth, and PBS NewsHour. Her, up, her uplift weathering hypothesis that addresses why climate changes on geologic timescales was the subject of both a PBS Nova and a BBS Horizon documentary. Hi, Mo. Now to Ruth DeFries. Dr. DeFries is co-founding dean of the Climate School and a professor of ecology and sustainable development at Columbia University. She uses images from satellites and field surveys to examine how the world's demands for food and other resources are changing land use throughout the tropics. Her research quantifies how these land use changes affect climate, biodiversity, and other ecosystem services, as well as human development. She has also developed innovative education programs and sustainable development. Ruth was elected as a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, one of the country's highest scientific honors. She received the MacArthur Genius Award, and she is the recipient of many other honors for her scientific research. And I'm very proud that Ruth chairs the Faculty Advisory Committee, committee for the Mumbai Global Center. Thank you, Ruth. Finally, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jo Julie Kornfeld, who as Vice Provost oversees the university's broad range of academic programs with a focus on compliance, policy, and regulatory requirements. She is, she is charged with facilitating partnerships with U.S. and foreign universities and organizations, managing the university's accreditation, coordinating academic reviews of schools, and advancing interdisciplinary initiatives. As a scholar, Julie focuses on public health education and teaches in the core curriculum at the Mailman School of Public Health, where she was previously vice dean for education and has been an associate professor of epidemiology since 2016. Welcome, Julie. Welcome, everyone. Uh, really, really a great pleasure and honor to have you with us here. So I'm going to start with a question to you, Alex, if I may. And um, if I can turn to you with a foundational question to begin our discussion, and that is, why a climate school? And why create such a school at Columbia? And why now? Okay, so I can talk about this for hours. So you need to shut me up if I go on too long. <laughs> this is, um, firstly, thanks a lot, Safwan. This is such a great opportunity to connect with our colleagues and, and others around the world uh, who want to find out about what we're doing in Colombia. Um, so we really appreciate this opportunity and we'll come back to the global connections a bit later. Um, but why a climate school? Well, climate is the biggest challenge we face globally going forward over this coming century. And right now we're uh, on a trajectory of emissions that are going to lead to serious degrees of warming, massive loss of ice sheets, raising sea level, uh, but also um, increased instability and storms. And we've been worried about California and the 
wildfires, have been worried about the drought there, which doesn't see much sign of uh, letting up. Um, but this, this is going to be far worse in the future, in the tropics in particular. And they're going to be parts of the world that are going to be hugely impacted by climate change. And uh, the great thing, of course, is many people around the world are waking up to it, including businesses and, and, um, and uh, cities. Uh, they're showing strong leadership. And so people are realizing we've got to do something drastic about this. Um, but typically we don't, um, we're not very good at thinking about these things in a, um, in a, a holistic way that actually um, um, shows leadership, global leadership. Um, and so a climate school is really about addressing these challenges and bringing people together across disciplines because it's a complicated issue. Um, you know, it's just like the Ebola crisis wasn't solved by um, simply some medicine. It required understanding of social anthropology to actually get to grips with that crisis. And it's a bit the same with climate change. There are a lot of things to do with the human behavior, understanding how we're going to actually influence the finances of the world, how we're going to rebuild um, the world's governance at some level around these issues of sustainability that are go beyond the science and go beyond the engineering solutions, which are also going to be incredibly important. So a climate school is a bit like um, 100 years ago well, when we had a pandemic. Huh. We had pandemics 100 years ago, and suddenly people realized that the answers to a lot of our health problems weren't just being so going to be solved by medicine. They were going to require an understanding of the environment in which people were living and how do we actually do something about that in a more holistic way. So, um, And so schools of public health were developed 100 years ago, and actually Columbia's celebrating its 100th anniversary of its school of public health this year. It's a wonderful occasion. Um, the same will be true in 100 years. Probably we'll have a climate, we'll have lots of climate schools around the world, and we'll be celebrating our 100th anniversary. And we'll be looking back and thinking about this is the time when people realized we had to think differently, work together across many different disciplines, and build the expertise uh, to really address these problems. Um, there's one last thing to say about a climate school. Um, and um, um, before I say a little bit about Columbia, um, this is an intergenerational human rights issue like no other. And so it really impacts young people and it's going to affect, you know, their, their future more than it is going to affect us. And so there is a sort of an ethical view of this is that we have to connect with young people and work with students in particular, but also others uh, to help them um, come to grips with what's going on, to, you know, help them become leaders in dealing with the crisis that they're going to be facing going forward. And, and why, so why a climate school? Well, you need the amazing interdisciplinarity you can achieve at a broad university of great academic prowess like Columbia. Um, but you also need top quality students coming in here, highly motivated from around the world to learn about climate and then go out into the world and, and become leaders. So quickly, why Columbia? Well, we're world leading in climate science, no question about that. Um, but we're also um, sitting here in New York which is not only the business capital of the world with Wall Street, it's the greatest city in the world, of course. Uh, and it's also, uh, but it's also got the United Nations and it's a city that's been heavily impacted by climate change already and is working in a more aggressive way than pretty much any other city in North America. So this is the perfect place to be doing this. And it's great to be part of this um, transition as we build the school. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. This is really, really wonderful and a great, uh... Uh, a great way to start the discussion. Let me pick up on something you said uh, about the climate school and about climate addressing climate change um, in a post uh, Glasgow world, for example. Um, you know, going beyond engineering and science. So I'm going to turn to Mo and then Ruth um, to help address the question of um, how do we ensure that the climate school is truly multidisciplinary um, in terms of its education programs and the research that's being done, uh, because we all know that, um, uh, you know, as important as the science base is, is uh, there are issues of social justice, there are issues of public health, uh, there are issues of law, um, there are all kinds of disciplines within the university, within the academy, um, that have something to say and uh, about you know how we address um, uh, climate change. So how are we thinking about this? How are we doing it? Uh, Mo, over to you, please. Thanks, Safwan. And 
I, I have to say your introduction and description of, of the climate change challenge was incredibly moving and, and insightful. I thought I really appreciated that introduction. Um, and, you know, again, uh, why Columbia? Why now? What Alex said, I mean, I, tr I attribute a lot of that to the leadership of our university, Alex, uh, Lee Bollinger. We have an incredible expertise in climate science at Columbia University and, and have had that for decades. Uh, cl climate modelers are some of the best in the world here. Um, and we've had all these incredible world leading expertise in all these other fields that are so critical to solving the climate change problem, governance, uh, health, uh, legal aspects, policy, um, uh, law, uh, finance, and, you know, many people were working across those disciplinary boundaries um, already. Um, just people that found each other, uh, climate modelers teaming up with Mike Girard in, in the law um, department, for instance, law school, or Kate Orff, who does, uh, land, you know, waterfront landscape resiliency uh, from the architecture perspective. Um, collaborating with uh, coastal scientists. And, you know, those are, that's how you need to solve the problems on the ground, right? It's writing another scientific paper isn't going to solve global warming in the, you know, around the world. And so the, the vision I'm just so impressed with of seeing how do we, how do we jumpstart and turbocharge those types of collaborations, right? You know, bring people together and, I think people have been really excited about this across the university. People are hungry to have their work have impact and you can't solve this problem without partnering with across disciplines. So it, it's very exciting. And, and I've always just been really proud of, of the leadership that's being shown on this here at Columbia. Great, thank you, thank you. Ruth, maybe addressing uh, the same question and, and you know, you're, uh, uh, maybe talk a little bit about sort of, you know, your background, right? Because, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, your work on uh, nutrition, for example, and, and uh, food um, resources and how that all uh, uh, intersects. Well, thank you, Safwan. And thank you all for joining. Greetings to everyone around the world. I love seeing the comments and, and coming in from, from people from so many different places. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, as Safwan said, and Mo said, and Alex said, uh, climate change is, is not just a scientific problem. It is a societal problem, a whole society problem. And we've seen in the past that when societal problems come to the fore, um, universities do respond. In the case of uh, urban poverty in the early 20th century, responded with uh, the School of Social Work, Alex mentioned uh, public health to respond to uh, disease, spread of disease and, and, and health for populations. So we're at a moment now where climate change is a societal problem and we need to address it as a societal problem, not just a scientific problem, as Mo said. So we need to train the workforce, do the relevant research and train the workforce and have the educational programs which can address this societal problem in all of its manifestations, whether it's people working in insurance or finance or working on international governance or uh, community engagement. Uh, we need that workforce to be in many, many different sectors of society to um, help us navigate through, uh, through this societal problem. So that's our thinking behind the education programs that we're developing to be able to provide the background in climate and the skills necessary to be able to take that background into many different sectors in the, uh, in the workforce, disaster response, that's another one. And underlying all of this, these, um, these skills we need in the workforce based in uh, understanding of, of climate change is the understanding of equity, 
and justice and uh, vulnerable populations and how to think about climate change fundamentally as a question of, of equity for intergenerational equity, with the community equity, across uh, human, non-human species equity, uh, so many aspects of, of equity that we are working towards, and we don't have an answer to this, but working towards how to build that kind of fundamental thinking into, uh, into our research and into our educational programs. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ruth. Um, so interdisciplinary current, um, you know, Columbia makes a lot of sense. New York makes a lot of sense. Um, one question I will come back to about the structure of the climate school before we delve into uh, some of the climate issues that, that um, you know, you're um, trying to address is the question of four deans. I mean, you know, this is the, I think, you know, in my academic career, in my life, and I'm sure um, anybody who's watching us today um, probably has never come across any school anywhere in the world that had four deans. Um, so, uh, you know, there's an easy answer, uh, right? Which is, you know, it's such an important thing. You need great minds uh, leading it. And uh, in the three of you and Jason Bordoff, uh, we have phenomenal minds, you know, that come together to lead it. But uh, that's my answer. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's 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 hear from you. Um, maybe Alex very quickly, or any of you. And then Julie, I want to come back to you and and pick up on what Alex said about the centennial for the School of Public Health, which is where you teach and see if we can throw some parallels. Alex? So, um, well, the, the four dean idea, I mean, I happily have five actually, but I mean, the point is that um, what we need to do to get this school, so let's step back a bit. The climate crisis is, isn't just an academic concern as we've just heard. It's something that is uh, a huge threat that we should be not just worried about, but a little bit frightened about going forward, about what it'll do to the planet and what it'll do to people. And some communities in particular need to be deeply concerned. And so we don't have time to hang around with this. We really need to get going quickly. And typically when we when we led the when I when I led the task force on climate um, and trying to ascertain what we should do, the idea of a school seemed like something that you build very slowly and it takes ages and it's kind of it becomes sort of ossified with departments and professors who never retire. You know, it's kind of like there's, uh, there's a sort of, um, you know, not, it's not really the young, dynamic, powerful entity that people are typically thinking of. So we decided this was going to be a school that's going to be different from the get-go. And in particular, we weren't going to have departments in the first instance, certainly. And we really just wanted, even though, and we we're going to take the whole of the uh, stuff that's not in the, any school right now that's relevant, the whole of Lamont or the Earth Institute, put that in the climate school to turbocharge our activity, so build it up immediately. So we've already got over 600 people in the school. We've only been going a few few months. So, um, uh, and we decided to get started immediately with education. So we've um, taken the Masters in Climate Society. We've got our first students, 85 students, I think it is roughly. Um, they're graduating this summer. This, you know, it's going to be fantastic. So we're getting going at an incredible pace to do this. And the co-founding deans was a stroke of genius, I think, to actually, um, I mean, you don't necessarily need co-founding deans uh, forever, but you, or maybe not every school needs them. But for us, it was really important to get something going in a, in a hurry. And we wanted to utilize the talents of a number of people uh, because building a, running a school is a big job. Building a school is massive. And uh, you need people with different expertise to, to help you do that. So it's not just the academic expertise, but the focus that each one has got on something slightly different. So Jason is focusing on our fourth purpose work. Ruth is focusing on our education. And Mo is focusing on building up the Office of Research so that we can actually be um, build up our research programs aggressively. And we're going fast. And we mean to go faster going right. forward. Right. And it's a reflection, I think, of the complexity of the issues that the school is trying to address that require different kind of expertise working together. And I think it's also very uh, symbolically very important, um, you know, the collaboration, the partnerships that need to take place at the very top and transcend um, the, the entire ecosystem that's dealing with it. 
More, Ruth, anything to add to, to what Alex has said? Yeah, I'll just uh, add that I think the four deans model is a co-deans model is a recognition that a big effort like this is a collective effort. We think about figureheads and deans of schools and these single leaders, but in reality, uh, you know, any big effort is built on the work and talents of many different people. I'm sure the same is true in the global centers and, uh, and any, any, uh, any big effort. So I think the four codings model just puts a stamp on uh, recognizing that uh, aspect of how institutions really work. And, uh, and with that, there's so many people working on the climate school in different ways, way beyond the four co-deans who are fundamental and, and critical to be able to, to build this, this school. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Uh, Julie, just, I mean, you know, what, what, what Alex mentioned in terms of the Centennial School of Public Health, uh, is there a parallel, you know, do you see, I mean, you know, take us maybe very quickly about sort of how, how critical was the establishment of the School of Public Health at Columbia and then, of course, at a number of other leading universities. Uh, how has that helped us deal with uh, public health issues? It did. It was started at Columbia at around the same time of the last major pandemic, and here we are uh, with another one. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love the analogy that Alex made in in terms of you know thinking a hundred years ahead now and 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 thinking about the, the the possibility of having many places that have uh, universities that have climate schools, much like people envisioned for the School of Public Health a hundred years ago. I, I, you know, I think. What's really interesting and, and intriguing to me is, is there, there are many parallels, I think, um, but, you know, in, in the, the development of a historical school of public health like Columbia was really a recognition that there were many people that needed to come together and think about causes further upstream than just in medicine and treating a patient who might be sitting in front of you with an illness, but really to, to make a much more collective effort to both study how it is that the patients come into illness in the first place and look at the causes of the cause and how do we look further upstream and really study and understand um, health, human health, and all that it encompasses, um, not just your physical health, but your emotional well-being, your social well-being, the cultural context that you live in, the social political context that um, leads to inequity and um, disparate health outcomes. And so I think a school of public, the schools of public health in Columbia of Node have really um, been bastions of that knowledge and discovery of how do you bring together experts across many disciplines to look collectively and apply their wisdom um, to solving problems before they happen. Um, in climate, we're, we're a little bit different in the sense that we're seeing the, the consequences of climate impact, but understanding the causes, working together across many disciplines, um, trying to educate the next generation of leaders who really can serve as both advocates, activists, and knowledge seekers in a, in a new arena is, is an incredible opportunity. And I see the parallels. And I've had the privilege of working um, with the founding deans, and in particular with Ruth and, and with Alex on, on the educational programs. And I think um, I see in my public health students, and now I think we'll see in future climate science students and climate health activists, um, this passion to change the world and a yearning to understand how to best do that. Um, and I think that's where this, the, the school is, is, is going to be um, the next leader in, in bringing people together to solve um, this global problem and as articulated before. So, you know, I, I would love to hear the, the deans talk a bit about the educational programs that I know we've been working on, because I think um, uh, these are really wonderful opportunities to um, tap into all reaches of the university, um, as well as to bring together students who are really incredibly excited about um, solving this next problem or this kind of problem. Yeah. Let's do that. And let's maybe talk about, you know, one of the, in my mind, um, one of the most prominent features of the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia um, is the global dimension, right? So the school is in the world and it does incredibly important work in Africa, in Asia, in other places. I've had the pleasure of uh, visiting, for example, some of the sites of ICAP, the International Center for AIDS Prevention, which has grown beyond AIDS, uh, of course, to, to deal with uh, all sorts of public health issues. 
Um, so maybe, I mean, if we can talk to Julie's sort of question or, or, or prod uh, about the educational programs that the school is offering, is contemplating, and how those are linked internationally. Um, maybe it's a two-part question, you know, to, to how are we focusing the efforts of the new schools to connect with students, scholars, research institutions um, around the world to help inform um, the work that uh, we are doing? How are we tapping into international networks? Who would like to take that? Alex? Um, well, I can kick off. Ruth is more of an expert on the details of our education programs, but uh, maybe I'll take the, the other way around and, and focus on the global aspects first. Um, the There is a, people around the world, of course, are concerned about climate, universities are concerned about climate, um, Nick Stern, who um, everybody knows, the London School of Economics, um, basically had put together a network of universities who were interested in education and research around the globe, working on uh, climate. It's called the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate. Uh, and of course, it includes Oxford, Cambridge, LSE. Um, it also includes Xinhua and a number of other universities around the world. Over here in America, Columbia's joined this. Um, Berkeley and MIT are in it as well. I think there's, and Yale, I think, has just joined as well. So I think there's a, you know, this the idea is to, to do two things. One is to share expertise and talk about what we could maybe do, even, you know, thinking about how to decarbonize our campuses, you know, comparing notes on that. Um, uh, but a lot of it's around educating young people and bringing people together and actually getting students to talk to each other about what they're doing and thinking about putting on programs that we can maybe work on together uh, globally, which I think is really, really exciting. The second thing is the um, the business community and and many others in um, in in um, in the world of of work are really, really interested in knowing about climate, and this is a global thing as well. And so Colombia has the opportunity to connect globally with communities, uh, with um, leaders of, of cities and, and other and other organisations. Um, and also businesses and provide expert expertise on expertise on what we can be doing and what, how the climate system works and what you should be worried about. And this is having a huge impact on the climate crisis because you now have major finance companies taking climate really seriously. And they mm. all know that their investors want to know about risk, climate risk, et cetera. They want educating. And of course, they also realize that certain investments are not as safe as others uh, going forward. And this is applied. This, so this is actually having an impact, impact on their investment strategy. And we've all shown, seen the amazing leadership Larry Fink has started showing in this area uh, for BlackRock. Um, this has real impact on companies and countries uh, in terms of their strategies going forward uh, in tackling climate change. So education globally is massively important. And the last thing I'll say, because I know Ruth is going to about to say the same thing, we need scholarships. So this is uh, an easy way for anybody in the world to come to Colombia and learn about the climate crisis. It's fine to set up a school in New York, but New York is one of the most expensive cities in the world. So the tuition tends to be quite expensive. And uh, many people who need to be educated from the global south simply aren't going to have the resources to get here. So we urgently need resources for this, um, to build scholarship programs, to make needs blind admission for people. Sorry, Ruth. Yeah, thank you for emphasizing the, uh, the, the need for scholarships. Our vision for what the student body might look like in the climate school is to have an incredibly diverse group of students from all parts of the world who are learning together about climate and going back to their uh, their countries and and working towards addressing the uh, the issue. So that diversity and international um, uh, student body is just incre incredibly important for everyone who's in the program and faculty, all of us, to be able to learn from each other about the different um, different perspectives that we get from people from different parts of the world. And climate change is such a thing where it's a global issue because the gases mix globally in the atmosphere, but climate change touches down so differently in different geographies. 
and one place it may be sea level rise, another place fires, and another place uh, people are vulnerable to storms. So there's so so many place specific aspects of climate. I think we need to build build that reality into our education program so people can relate directly to how climate change is affecting uh, different places differently, and also the ability to uh, to mitigate climate change, reduce emissions, or what those strategies might be is very different in, in different places, different development needs, different trajectories for, for uh, energy and land use. So we need to keep, keep thinking about climate as a global issue, but mm-hmm. build in the perspective that, that it plays out differently in in different places. And the way to, to foster that understanding is by having a diverse international mix of students and create the opportunities for students to, uh, to experience, hopefully firsthand, uh, um, different parts of the world. Thank you, thank you. So Mo, let me turn to you and, and sort of staying with the global dimension of this and uh, the question about developing countries in particular. Uh, how can we support developing countries, right? I mean, you know, so one way is by providing scholarships, you attract students who come from all over the world, uh, who do not otherwise have the means to come and be educated. That's fantastic. That's essential, right? Uh, But how do we work with developing countries? How do we work with governments? Um, uh, How do we support uh, countries that um, are committed to doing what they can do to, uh, for, for climate change. I mean, just you know, forgive me for a second, like COP26, there was a pledge made by 100 countries, if I'm not mistaken, to halt and reverse uh, deforestation, to cut the emissions of greenhouse gas by 2030. Um, how can we encourage that kind of work? What's the role of the academy um, in, in helping meet that, those challenges? That's a great question, Stefan. And it, it gets to the heart of climate justice and environmental justice, right? I mean, all the world is suffering from a crisis that was created by, you know, the privileged Western world over the last century. Um, So, you you know, there's, there's many ways here. You also mentioned IRI and Lisa Goddard. IRI has pioneered 20 years of recognizing that we can make short-term weather predictions and climate predictions right now, and that information can be used to save lives and and improve people's lives right now, and have spent 20 years building those relationships around the world in Africa and South America and Asia. Um, And and they're powerful and they're effective, and, and they are like an inspiration for what we can do in so many other areas. The key to that all is always partnerships. Partnerships take time to build and nurture. I see the Columbia Global Centers as as just an amazing resource that Columbia University has. It has this distributed global network. Um, I can think of 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 an example that I'm involved with right now, which is EPEC, who's the director of the Istanbul Global Center, reached out to me and said, I have many local stakeholders and organizations that are very concerned about the future of the Sea of Marmara, which is obviously an essential um, uh, waterway for the world uh, in terms of sea level rise. And what is that going to, how is that going to impact the waterway? How is that going to impact communities? And we are building a a collaborative team between Turkey and here with, with people stemming from um, geophysicists to engineers to like landscape uh, resiliency architects all coming together to try to build a team to address this question on the ground there. And, And that wouldn't have happened without the global centers. And I really hope that you know, all the global centers around the world use that they say, wow, we could use some help with this, or this is a problem. Let's tap into this incredible network that we're building at Columbia University. Speaking to the education thing too, again, there was so much to do and so many ideas that were just limited by the amount of time we have in a day. But we can br- try to bring people to do a one year of master's degree 
in New York City from around the world or the global south, but we also can go to them. We can run summer schools, three-week summer schools or two-week summer schools tailored to, as Ruth said, the unique challenges being faced by that part of the world. So I, yeah. again, it comes back to why Columbia, why now? Columbia has so many resources that just can all be brought together and, and, and kind of weaponized in a way to address this global crisis in, in a very effective way. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. And we actually, the Climate School and the Global Centers are working with another very innovative entity at Columbia, and that's Columbia World Projects. Yes. Right? On trying to tap into um, experts in the various regions of the world who can help uh, help us with setting the agenda. But let, let, let's turn, since you mentioned Istanbul and Ipek Cemtaha, let me turn to another Global Center location, Rio. And this is something, Ruth, you've written and spoken about quite a bit. And that's basically the, the um, um, rainforest, right? And uh, what we've been seeing in the Amazon basin. And, you know, for many developing countries, the destruction of the forests is a means of economic growth as, as local governments may see it. So how do we deal with this uh, really inherent and, and very real um, conflict? What What's your, uh, uh, if you can maybe sum up for us, <laughs> some of what you uh, have been thinking. Oh, I could talk about this this uh, topic for the rest of the time. So I'll, I'll yeah. try not to. <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> um, uh, tropical forests are just so important for, for so many different reasons. One is they sequester a lot of carbon and keep it from going into the atmosphere. They uh, provide habitat for biodiversity and water cycling and provide, uh, provide um, livelihood needs for, for local people who, who live in, in the forest. So just so many reasons. We have to always remember that Europe and North America cleared their forests and cleared their prairies, uh, essentially expand agriculture as part of the development trajectory. So deforestation is not just a, a global South issue. At this time in history, that's where the deforestation is because that's where the remaining forests uh, are. Today, there's so many different causes of deforestation around the world in different places, but the main, you know, big areas of deforestation, as in the arc of deforestation in the Amazon and in Brazil and in Southeast Asia, a lot of that deforestation is around uh, commodity production for, uh, for soy and palm oil and a lot of it around uh, um, producing beef. So the kind of deforestation where we think, where we sort of traditionally think about somebody cutting down a tree to be able to plant a you know, small scale farmer, that's really not the reality in those places where deforestation is most intense. It's really very commodity driven, linked with international supply chains. Uh, so there is quite a lot of attention now through these commitments uh, that you spoke about earlier on the part of corporations to, uh, to try to ensure that those commodities are not produced with, uh, with deforestation. So there's a lot of work to do to be able to, uh, to make good on those commitments and, and, uh, and, and address this important issue and deforestation is about roughly about nine or 10 percent of, of um, global emissions. So it, it's getting quite a lot of attention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alex, let's I mean, we can't talk about climate and climate change and, and the world without talking about China um, and U.S. China and um you know, they uh, pledged the two countries to boost climate cooperation over the next decade. Uh, to rein in climate uh, damaging emissions and so on and so forth. Um, how serious do you think these efforts are? Um, how do you see do you see cooperation advancing? You know, what is the um, the outlook from where you sit? And how do we, as an academy, as the academy, also uh, continue? I mean, you know, we have a center in Beijing, a global center. Um, we're active in China. We feel that our presence in China is perhaps more important now than ever because of the rising uh, tensions in U.S.-Sino uh, relations. 
Can you comment on that in the uh, in the context of uh, climate change and, and cooperation or lack thereof? So China, uh, China is hugely important. It's like, a, you, know, the, the, you know, one of the big things we have to really do is to de- decarbonize the way China is operating. And it's been an amazing, I mean, China is such an amazing place. I visited there in 1982. And then, of course, you go back you know, 10, 20 years later, you realize how incredible it is that that this country of such scale has changed so dramatically and and come to grips with the opportunity to really do something for its own people and uh, improve their standards of living. And, you know, no one can blame them for wanting to do that. It's exactly what they should be doing. And of course, what is involved is at some level um, providing cheap energy. And so the um, amount of uh, expansion of power plants uh, across China has been astonishing, and just as the city has changed, of course, alongside that. So, of course, China, in the process, um, created a ton of pollution, uh, and this ended up being, um, even though they're not a democracy like uh, like the U.S. is, um, there's no question that, that people were complaining about the amount of pollution going on and this actually had quite an important impact on um, decisions to try and decarbonize the power system and do other things as well. So I think the, um, the motivations may have been somewhat different, um, but the pollution issue was, became so big for them that they re- really started to take it very, very seriously. And they've got other problems with pollution in terms of their, their you know, the, the runoff from their agriculture as well. Um, but this uh, pollution actually, when I visited China, Pollution has almost been the key thing that people are most keenly aware of, as you know, the the, the um, something that some something should lead you to do something about the climate crisis and the energy change and change energy sources. So, um, but of course, there are other issues that they face and will face. And in particular, some of their cities are incredibly vulnerable to uh, the effects of rising sea level. Um, and there are going to be um, big impacts uh, because A, those cities are very big, and and B, they are um, facing regions where there could be flooding from the ocean and in some cases flooding from some of the major rivers coming down as well. So they face huge issues going forward. Um, I think it was really unfortunate that we sort of lost the leadership in America in terms of um, the agenda of pulling out of IPCC. for a while, and the communication broke down somewhat between China and America. Um, and actually, it's really good to see that you know reengagement taking place around climate change, and it's taking place despite all the other tensions between America and China. And I think that's tremendously important, and I think people will be pushing to try and achieve more going forward. Um, there was also a certain element of. Um, I think, concern that actually while China was getting winding down its coal-fired power stations in China because of the pollution issues, um, it was still building them elsewhere in the world as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And so, um, you know, I think they're turning turning around on that now as well. So I see them as as a a really important partner in in, uh, what we're trying to do globally. Um, I was asked to speak at Tsinghua for the, they, they decided a number of places across China decided to set up net zero institutes, which I think is great. So they, they're saying, okay, how are we going to get to net zero in China? We say we're going to do it by 2060. And the government and the universities and the, and the regions have said, okay, let's take this seriously. Let's power up our universities and think about this problem. And they're doing it on a big scale and actually building these institutes to really focus on how are we going to decarbonize. So working with China, I think, is going to be great and very, very important and effective going forward. And um, and there's there, there's cause, I think, for for some level of optimism despite the the tensions that there are in the back in the back of the world. That's really really wonderful to hear, Alex. That really is. That really is. And I think the academy is the one place that must preserve. Um, opportunities for collaboration and for engagement and the exchange of ideas, uh, regardless of the political climate and the tensions that might exist. Um, We're going to turn to the questions from the audience, which Julie will guide us through in just a minute. But I thought uh, 
perhaps one question I'd like to address, you know, any of you, but more in particular, especially given that I know you have to leave more in a few minutes. Um, uh, we really appreciate you being here with us. And that is a question that I'm sure Julie has come across in the uh, Q&A, and I get asked a lot, you know, by young people all over the world, uh, especially in the developing part, uh, you know, parts of the world that say, how can I make a difference, right? You know, there's an, some obvious answers, come to the climate school and study at Columbia and then, you know, pursue a career in in um, um, in the field. But, you know, short of that or on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, what what would you tell young people in India, in Jordan, in, um, you know, in Sweden, in Brazil, you know, wherever, um, of sort of what they can do on a day-to-day -day basis to bring about greater awareness, to put more pressure on governments, to play um, a positive, proactive role? Uh, great question. Um, you specifically asked about young people rather, rather than my generation. My generation, I mean, it, it, as we said, it is a moral issue. The future is now. The decisions we are making is what our children and grandchildren are going to have to deal with. But when someone asks me that question, I usually say, uh, remember your friend Bev, B-E-V, buy, educate, vote. Mm. We all are consumers in some way. And, you know, I believe in the power of the purse and, and the market will adjust to give you what you want. You know, if it's an electric car versus a gas powered car, um, you know, you can choose to eat chicken over beef. Educate yourself. It, you know, be, become informed. Once you know about the climate problem, educate your friends, educate your families, educate your communities, and then vote. The most powerful thing you can do is vote for change. Thank you. Thank you. And easy to remember and uh, not that difficult to implement, right? You know, in, in, in small but and in big ways. It, it would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Can I just dive in here as well? Because I think one of the things that's been really important in the last few years has been the activism of young people uh, globally. And that's actually had a, a really strong impact from the point of view, not just of the, the demonstrations, but the fact that they're making people feel bad about not taking stronger decisions and faster decisions. And I think that's there's and activism is really, really important in changing what's going on. And we need to think about, I mean, typically universities don't think of them themselves as activist organizations. They like to provide the scholarly impartial evidence to, to, for decision making. But this is a problem that actually requires some level of activism uh, and also some level of communication to people who don't understand it so that they actually get it, get this and start doing something about it. So right. I do think that's going to be a key part of what we need to do with the climate school as well as facilitating support for activism. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. It's really very powerful, really important. Activism does not necessarily mean, you know, demonstrating and protesting. I mean, that's part yeah. of it, right? But activism in every way, activism by buying, I mean, that that's a form of activism and educating and voting. And I think very, very importantly is... Um, being good role models. I mean, you know, to try to be good role models for our children and grandchildren. And, you know, frankly, I find with the younger people, you know, my, my nephews and nieces are my role models when it comes to the environment, right? Because they have a sensibility and sensitivity um, around things that's really um, inspiring. We met, we met with uh, Obama at COP. Yes. COP. yes. And what he wanted to do was meet with young people. Mm. And he brought together some of the young activists around the world. There was one woman there from Germany who, I think she's 25 or something, and she's, she basically sued the German government and won. And just think, well, what do we need to do to help people to do that kind of thing? You know, right. the university should be able to provide know-how around those kinds of issues, even though we don't want to call ourselves activist organizations ourselves. We should be able to provide the, the background information and support for people who do want to be activists. I think that's quite an important thing for us to think about um, going forward. 